Have you ever wondered whether it's possible to one-shot every boss in Dark Souls from a fresh save file? Well, me neither. That is, until one day I received an invite from none other than Lemon T Backlogs himself to compete against a bunch of other Souls YouTubers in the Dark Souls One-Shot Contest. Glad to be included, and I'm honored you scrolled back eight months in your watch history just to remember my name. About a week before starting this challenge, if you had uttered the words, Painted World of Ariamis to me, I would have responded, Oh, you mean the Dark Souls 3 DLC? Needless to say, my game knowledge was a little bit lacking. However, I wouldn't consider myself to be the underdog by any means. Sure, I haven't been running this game since my conception in the womb like some of these other guys, but I still have an advantage over the competition, because I have an excess of free time and absolutely zero sex. Why did I write that? So here I am, a hundred or so hours of the best years of my life down the drain, and I'm excited to show you all what I've been cooking up. Before that, though, the rules are kind of important for this run since I can't just improvise my own whenever things get too difficult. This is a contest and we're all trying not to get our runs disqualified. First thing I want to clear up is that a one-shot more or less means one attack press, but we call it a one-shot because that rolls off the tongue better and makes more effective clickbait. The ramifications of this are that multi-hit attacks on weapons like the Halberd and spells like Fire Tempest are totally fine. Everyone's allowed to create and reload backup saves too, and you know I'm gonna exploit the hell out of that. As for deciding the winner of this contest, one point is awarded to the player per boss one-shot, and every point earned allows the player to level up one time. This extends to more than just bosses though, as every non-respawning mini-boss is also worth a point. And the elderly among you might be thinking, this kinda sounds like the rule set, the ancient deity known as Vegeta 311, engraved into the divine tablet of some reddit post a decade ago, but there's a few distinctions. Our rule set doesn't allow any glitches like tumble buffing or move swapping, every NPC and invader is also worth a point, and the Four Kings entire health bar has to be drained in one attack because Lemon didn't want to see anyone complete this I guess. There's a ton of other rules and edge cases, but I'll spare you the whole encyclopedia and start talking about the run now, which officially begins after leaving the Undead Asylum and landing at Firelink Shrine. For this run, the Pyromancer is undoubtedly the best starting class. This is due to its good base stats and immediate access to the Pyromancy Flame, which allows the player to cast the damage buff Power Within before even defeating a single boss. In light of this, I obviously intentionally kneecapped my run by choosing Hunter class because I thought it would be quirky. Did it work? Do you guys think I'm unique? Please, for the love of God, give me some validation. Now, most people will probably immediately begin grinding for a weapon and items so they can start one-shotting things, but we're gonna claim our first point right away. We're allowed to attack NPCs to aggro them, then reload the area to restore their health while keeping aggro. So we do exactly that to the Crestfallen Knight, then lure him to the edge of the shrine. One kick is officially seen as an attack press, so we'll need to make it count. I didn't have to do this and don't need the point yet, but I did it anyways because Lemon said it would be funny if someone Sparta kicked an NPC off a ledge. So this one's for you. Or it would have been, if my kick actually connected. Zero hit kills still count, so... Make that our first point, I guess. We've got a lot of prep work to do before we can properly start one-shotting enemies, so strap in because this grocery errand spans the entirety of Lordran. We start with the usual path through the Undead Burg, buy a reinforced club from the Undead Merchant, then, right before the Taurus Demon, we make a little detour, unlocking a shortcut to the Dark Group Basin with the Master Key. We run past Havel down to the Valley of Drakes, grabbing the ever-important Red Tearstone Ring in the process. We start farming the drakes for souls to upgrade our club and buy the crest of Artorius, because I would rather open the Darkroot Garden shortcut now than later. Farming drakes with an unupgraded weapon might sound like the dumbest waste of time a person can subject themselves to, but the bleed buildup on the reinforced club combined with how easily they stagger made it pretty manageable. I was hoping to grab some lucky dragon scale drops here too, so I would have less grinding later, since, as a Dark Souls challenge runner, the Dragon Covenant pipeline comes for us all. With the grinding done, we run through the Darkroot Garden and quickly nab the Hornet Ring from Sif's Arena. Next up, we head all the way to Blighttown to beat the shit out of some slugs for their green Titanite shards. The Power Within spell I mentioned earlier is also obtainable here, but we won't need it yet. Anyone who has seen Vegeta 311's run might realize that I'm pretty much following what he did one to one. So I guess if I'm going to copy Vegeta, I might as well become Vegeta. See you all at the catacombs, nerds.
Now that we've made it to the catacombs, Vamos the Absolute G ascends our shitty little club to a plus five fire weapon of the gods, and with our newly upgraded murder stick, the hornet ring, and the red tearstone ring all active, it's finally time to start the bloodbath. And buckle up because we're covering all 130 of them. The Black Knight of the Catacombs is already surrounded by coffins, so we give him a head start on the funeral procession. The undead merchant tries to refer me to his no refund policy, so I refer his brain matter to the concrete. Havel learns the only thing I love more than smashing rocks is smashing skulls. The Darkroot Knight gets turned into fertilizer, and the Taurus Demon gets his soft spot stepped on. Solaire's teeth engage in jolly cooperation with the back of his throat. The Tower Black Knight tries to give up his sword as a piece offering, but he's gonna have to give up that ass too. The Armored Tusk gets spit-roasted harder than your mom last night, while the Baronite Knight steps into the light. We slap that trident out of the Channeler's hands and move on to the Lower Berg. Griggs is trapped and needs someone to free him, but the only thing we'll be freeing him from is this mortal coil. Okay, wait, wait, wait. We can't actually kill him yet. He, uh, sells an item we need. Managing every NPC was one of the most volatile parts of routing this run. Sometimes we'd need to complete an NPC questline just to get a specific item, or sometimes they'll provide an essential service, but conversely, at certain points in the game, they might just disappear. For example, if you kill Siegmeyer too early, then Siegland won't show up at all, soft-locking us out of two points. It was agreed that if an NPC dies as part of their questline or off-screen somehow, we'd receive the point, which is the only way to get a point for Anastasia, the firekeeper at the Firelink Shrine, who is otherwise unkillable. And yes, thanks to this run, I've now memorized the name of every Dark Souls NPC, yet I still don't remember my own mother's birthday, so... Fucking cheers to that. Already we've cleaned up a ton of early game kills, and if you blinked you might have even missed that we beat the first boss somewhere and all that. Next up is the Capper Demon, and we've already got everything necessary. All that's left is to enter the room, get boxed in by his dogs, and die. Definitely planned for that. Next attempt a plunging attack makes short work of him. With the Depths key in hand, we enter the meat layer and tenderize both butchers for two points. Well, technically one point, because the second butcher takes fall damage while jumping off its post, meaning it gets disqualified here, so pull that fun fact out next time you host Dark Souls Trivia Night. It doesn't actually matter since it happened to literally everyone, so I think Lemon's just gonna give us all the point anyway. But thank you to the guy who pointed this out and tried to get us all disqualified. You know who you are. Now that we're in the depths, we take out the giant rat and channeler for two more points, then immediately dip out, as we're not quite ready for anything more than that. At the Firelink Shrine, the Way of- Oh fuck, this part of the script is awful. Back at the Firelink Shrine, the Way of White Covenant have all gathered to bask in awe at my arrival. Rhea's already down on her knees, ready for me to show her my Way of White, and Quadruple Homicide makes my rope shoot like you wouldn't believe. With all four of them dead, it's time to make a quick pit stop at the good ol' Asylum. I died more to these flailing torch hollows than I did to both Black Knights and Oscar combined. Afterwards, we grind to upgrade our Pyroflame to plus 10, as that's what makes Qualana appear in our next destination, Blight Town. At the lowest point of Shitwater Puddle, we pop a humanity to lure in Maneater Mildred, who takes a brisk beating before fading into nothing. We make a quick journey up to the bad side of Blight Town to nab the power within Pyromancy, as we'll finally be forced to use it for the first time. Now it's time to go back all the way up to the gargoyles. God damn, my man's getting his 10,000 steps for sure today. After buffing with power within and dropping into red tearstone range, the gargoyles each fold like paper, netting us two more points. Now with the gargoyles down and the first bell rung, we can head back to Blight Town. I really couldn't have picked a better route, what is wrong with me? Since our next target is immune to fire, we'll need to upgrade a new weapon. I opted for the Black Knight Greatsword because it was the highest damage potential for the least amount of grinding, because I guess I wanted to pretend that I suddenly value my time. This also means that for the first time this run, we'll be spending points to level up. We need enough strength and dex to wield the sword in the first place, so we level those, plus a few extra in strength for good measure. And that's all the prep we'll be doing before Quelag. When I was first testing this fight, I thought for sure I'd have to do some insane grinding, like maxing out the Dragon Covenant for the 27.5% damage buff, and using the Dragon King Great Axe or something. But the actual solution has less to do with dumb, boring math, and more to do with smacking her in the face, but better 
Now, to be clear, I didn't come up with the idea to use the terrain in this boss arena for a plunging attack. If I did, you would hear me sound super excited about it while mansplaining the whole thing. I stole the idea from somebody else, just like everything else in this run so far. And this is the part where I show my cool victory, but um, we're not actually strong enough to hit the one-shot. But it's okay, because after two quick weapon upgrades and more points into strength, we return to Quayleg to enact our sweet revenge. Oh, what? Bro, there's no way. Wait, I still... Oh my god, I need to level up more. I had a bunch of notes written down to prevent this exact scenario, but when I read them back, they just say to, quote, hit her but do it really hard. I also neglected to write down what strength stat I needed to hit the kill range for any of these fights, so I'm stuck guessing there too. After creeping our strength stat up to 25, we step back into that arena to attempt the exact same thing again, and... <laughs> oh, would you look at that, my numbers are high enough this time. That wouldn't have been so bad if I didn't have to do it four times. I saw a lot of others complaining about what a frustrating crapshoot this boss is, but there are several fights later that are way worse in the RNG department. Man, that wasn't even that hard. <laughs> With that obstacle cleared, we continue on past the second bell. I didn't want to ring it yet because Latrek kills Anastasia after ringing both bells, and I somehow convinced myself that I really wanted the Firelink Shrine to be active for a teeny bit longer, but it super did not matter. So for context, this next track came about when I accidentally landed on Quayleg before doing a plunging attack, which ticked about 3 health off of her. So naturally, I checked with Lemon to make sure that was okay, and he said the damage you inflict landing on an enemy is fine as long as it's all part of one plunging attack and you don't just land and jump repeatedly. Which makes complete sense, but what he didn't account for was that a naked psycho was on the loose and about to commit murder with his feet. I could give a full explanation, but all you really need to know is that Ceaseless Discharge has to be damaged six times while hanging off this ledge to kill him. So sit back and enjoy the dumbest boss one-shot you've ever seen. Let's go! Please tell me that that counts, by the way. With that, we gain access to the Demon Ruins, and... Well, now's as good a time as any to upgrade our Pyroflame to Ascended plus 5. I mean, it'll only take 300,000 souls, what? Hey gamers, it's me, your favorite C-list Dark Souls challenge runner. Except, I'm a little bit older now. I finished grinding 300k in Dark Souls, and I'm super excited to murder this old woman in cold blood. Yay. Time to hit that second bell, just like how you, the viewer, should hit that bell next to the subscribe button so you don't miss out on the next- With the second bell rung, we can now enter Sen's Fortress. Before heading back up, we nab the Chaos Storm Pyromancy by offering 30 humanity to the Fair Lady, then put 4 points into attunement so we have enough slots to use it in conjunction with Power Within. Upon arriving at Firelink Shrine, we confirm the death of Anastasia and force Laurentius to play a deadly game of Jump Rope. He doesn't win. Since the Dragon King Great Axe will be useful soon, we head back to the depths to fight the Gaping Dragon, remembering to kill the Invader Kirk along the way. We enter the fight once to cut off his tail, which is allowed by the way, quit out and one-shot the Gaping Dragon with our new spell, Chaos Storm. This and Fire Tempest are going to be our highest possible damage against most bosses from here on out. On the way to Sens, we make a quick pit stop to take out the Prowling Demon near Andre, then, realizing I forgot about the Dragon Crest ring, we swing back around to buy it from Griggs. This required us to put 11 points into Intelligence just to talk to him, a stat I wish certain people would spec into before leaving comments on my videos. Once inside Sens' Fortress, we set our sights on the four Prowling Demons lurking at the bottom, this ended up being far more frustrating than I had bargained for. I might have even died to these guys more times than Quaylike. After a fair few attempts, they eventually melt to one shot of Fire Tempest or Chaos Storm each. Climbing a ladder back up, we take out the Fortress Gate Opener for another point. Then, of course, we make our way through the rest of Sen's Fortress to... Okay, never mind, where the hell are we going? Scratch that, it's time to fight the heckin' Pupper Sif. If we're gonna slaughter canines, we might as well extend our reach to felines as well. There are three rolling cats in the forest, and they are just the darndest things. It takes both Power Within and Red Tearstone Ring to one-shot them with the Black Knight Greatsword. It takes a few trips, but that's a fairly easy three points. 
Somewhere around this time I killed a forest knight that didn't respawn that counted as a mini boss, and all I have to say to that is thank god I was one-shotting all of them just to be safe. There are two more targets like that in the forest, but we'll come back for them later, because I did not know which of the dozen or so random ghost dudes just so happened to have a single bit set that tells the game not to respawn them. For now we join the forest hunters, which causes two more target NPCs to spawn, and ooh, here I go up to my nefarious deeds again. With Shiva and his bodyguard deleted, we light up the Moonlight Butterfly, and now it's finally time to conquer Sen's fortress. For realsies this time! Psych, you just got Undead Asylumed. Share this video with your friends to totally Undead Asylum them. With the stray demon burnt to a crisp, now it's time for Sen's fortress. For double realsies this time. Clearing out the fortress, we free Big Hat Logan, then kill a Mimic, Ricard, the Crestfallen Merchant, and the Firebomb Giant. Last is the Iron Golem, who easily falls to a single Chaos Storm. Also, it doesn't really matter, but I frequently forget to drink my flasks after these kills, which drastically reduces the cool factor. I'm such a fucking idiot, man. After getting kidnapped and dragged to Anor Londo, we smash this Mimic near the Giants, then work our way down to fight a Gargoyle. This guy isn't any stronger than the gargoyles from earlier, so he goes down with a quick red tear stone ring plus power within setup. Same deal for the second one. Working our way deeper into Anorlando, we break open three more mimic chests and obtain the Havel set. Though the fact that we almost always die in a single hit means the extra poise is kind of useless. I could level up endurance and health, but how are we going to fit that into the budget? I have to power level my strength stat just to feel something anymore. After melting another prowling demon, we invade the world of Knight Latrek. I killed both of his ally phantoms in one hit because I couldn't remember if they were targets. Did I mention I spent every moment of this run in a state of constant paranoia? Time for Ornstein and Smoke. It's a bit of a pain to land a hit on Ornstein without getting ass blasted by Smoke, but eventually we get a hit off and realize we don't do enough damage. The reason I missed the range here is because a little bit of liquid courage is often all it takes to convince you that you really need to kill Ornstein last since the Leo ring he drops might be super necessary for a super cool strat later, and when the sobriety set in, I was left with unintelligible notes that said dumbass things like grind 40 dragon scales to upgrade your Dragon King Great Axe and unlock the Dragon Torso. We are fortunately only going to waste our time with one of those things, that being upgrading the Great Axe. But to do that, we'll need to go back to the Valley of Drakes, which means it is time for the mother of all runbacks. If I don't make it, please tell my mom. Happy birthday. While we're here, it would be a waste not to go on another rampage. We end up killing Ingward, both New Londo soul masses, and the undead dragon in the Valley of Drakes. After that, it was time to grind for 10 dragon scales. So, maybe a hundred dead drakes later, and we've got all the scales we need. So we walk back to the boss room, and they've already died of old age. At least I wish it were that easy, but the truth is there's still a lot of bullshit to go through. If every death is a learning experience, then consider me encyclopedic. Sometimes I would get killed for bad positioning, bad timing, bad luck, or if the game was feeling quirky, maybe God himself would descend from heaven to deliver unto me these fucking hands. I'll try... What the fuck? Every copy of Dark Souls is personalized. When all the unlucky bullshit was out of the way, it was pretty easy to take out Ornstein, then all that was left was to pray for Chaos Storm RNG against Smoke. You guys have no idea! You have no idea! Yes! 
Finally! And that marks the end of the hardest fight so far. I spend a bit of time exploring Anorlando and enter the painted world for the first time by accident, not realizing I'd be trapped inside. Cool painting. Oh, you can actually... Uh-oh. I was not joking about what I said at the start of the video. Fortunately, we're more than prepared to tackle what lies ahead, as long as we don't get lost, which we do. We kill the undead dragon here, and also King Jeremiah. While trying to navigate out, we stumble upon this area with the most powerful enemy FromSoft has ever designed, then end up nabbing the Fire Surge Pyromancy, which is probably the single weakest offensive pyromancy in the game. Granted, you can move around while casting it, and it has lots of casts, but... I could not think of a single reason to use it over Fire Tempest other than comedy, and I'm just not funny enough for that. Anyways, take the plunge, you won't die. <laughs> Has anyone else cracked that joke before? I doubt it. We put a big soup bowl in its rightful resting spot, and the path that each of the four lords opens up. We can do these in any order, but for our first target, we're heading down to the bright orange demon ruins. There, we defeat Knight Kirk for the second time, and torch the Fire Sage with Chaos Storm. This one I was sure would be immune to fire, but hey, less thinking for me. We abuse our privilege as a Chaos Servant to open this giant shortcut door to the next area. Uh, ow, why is there a burning sensation in my frontal lobe. Ah! Hey guys, it's me, your favorite B-list Dark Souls challenge runner. I've become slightly more famous since the start of this video. I'm not sure what happened in the last hour or so, I just remember blacking out, and when I woke up I had three more points in the orange charred ring. Weird. The Duke's Archive is next, and I'm getting kinda tired of listing every single kill, and they're all done in the exact same way, so here's a lightning round of every point we obtained on the way to see. With all those enemies beaten, we can finally begin our battle with Seat the Scaleless. For this fight, I went with the usual Chaos Storm, plus... Uh, oh, he's dead already. The more important plot point here is that we buy everything from Big Hat Logan, which causes him to go insane. Look, we can all agree that this one was self-defense, right? I'm the good guy here. And you know what they say? Like teacher, like pupil. On the way to see Siegmeier, we end up one-tapping Siegland. Earlier in this run, I accidentally killed all the enemies below Siegmeier before talking to them, and if you do that, his questline just ends and both characters disappear. These are undoubtedly the easiest NPCs to miss out on. With maybe one exception, but we'll get to that. Siegmeier soon joins Siegland in the Onion Afterlife. When you've been one-shotting so many enemies, it can be easy to think that you have all the tools you need to be everything in the game, but the Darkroot Bazin Hydra is here to keep my ego in check. We come so close, but ultimately, it's finally time to fold and accept the Dragon Covenant into my life. In hindsight, I learned we could've just blasted his shit with Crystal Soul Mass and called it a day. Sometimes you only realize the obvious stuff after you've wasted four hours of your life. I'm a dragon now. You may not like it, but this is what peak performance looks like. With the extra damage, we easily have enough to one-shot the Hydra, though it is a bit tricky to time since the torso buff only lasts a few seconds. We reload the area and crack open a Kinder Surprise Golem containing a woman inside of it, which kinda sucks because I already got one earlier from that other Golem. But where you see a human being with feelings, I see the freest point of my life. Technically two points, since killing Dusk means Elizabeth will also be dead on arrival in the Ulysseal Sanctuary because... Time travel? Speaking of which, it is now officially DLC hours. If you were worried the Flowers for Algernon gameplay would stop at the Hydra, boy do I have a treat for you. I really wish it were possible to play Dark Souls sober, because maybe then my notes would have been useful and I might have remembered that we could use Fire Tempest here instead of failing to one-shot the Sanctuary Guardian for an hour then proceeding to grind for a plus five Crystal Great Club. Let's go. Before this challenge, I had never once touched the Artorius of the Abyss DLC. I imagine some of these fights are fun. Not that I'd know, because the only time I've ever fought Artorius, I rolled once, pressed the right bumper on my controller, then the fight ended. After Artorius, there's a couple mimics, NPCs, and an invader all worth a point each. Hawkeye Go lands the cleanest trick shot of his career, grounding the Black Dragon Calamy and letting us slide in there to cook it alive with Fire Tempest. I've got a slightly embarrassing confession to make, and maybe some of you guys can relate. I have always hated the fact that jump, roll, and sprint are all bound to the same button. Several times now I've died because I tried to roll immediately after sprinting, causing my character to jump. This happened even more in the Calamite fight than usual. 
Eventually I got so fed up that I checked if there was a way to rebind just the jump button, and there is. In my defense, I don't think this was an option in the Prepare to Die edition of this game. To prove this isn't cope, the literal first attempt after rebinding the jump button, we avoid a death directly thanks to the new controls and proceed to one-shot him. <gasps> Wait, I win! I win, I win, I win! Tell me I win, tell me I win, tell me I win! Say I win, say I win, say I win, say I win! <gasps> yes! Let's fucking go. There was one boss we left alive back in the Demon Ruins. The Demon Centipede. With access to Darkbeed from the DLC, we level up Intelligence to 32 so we can wield the Tin Crystallization Catalyst and one-tap that firebug with the Dark Souls equivalent of a magic shotgun. Since the last boss of the DLC is undoubtedly going to be a massive roadblock, we might as well do a bit of cleanup in case we hit the contest deadline and are forced to quit early. We claim our last two points from the Darkroot Forest, take out the Blighttown Parasite we avoided earlier, the Drake on the Bridge, the Ash Lake Hydra, Cockeye Joe, Patches, the Prowling Demon from the Catacombs, Pinwheel, by the way, Lemon has the raw footage and he can confirm I did not end up in the Pinwheel Hall of Shame, the Tomb Black Knight, Invader Leroy, and finally we arrive at Gravelord Nido. I pretty much approached this fight the same way I did on my first ever playthrough of this game, that is, I downgraded the Occult Club and used its Divine to perma the skeletons in the boss arena before fighting Nido himself. Other than that, pretty easy one-shot. Hey Guinevere, could you please turn down the sun? Thanks. After defeating Solar Radiation for good, the three Dark Moon Blades come out to play. As is standard practice, we slap Gwendolyn with the Big Dragon Axe, marking a temporary pause to our cleanup of Lordran. Now for the moment I've been putting off, fighting Manus father of the abyss. It's probably no exaggeration to say that in the month of May 2023, the number of people in the world who have successfully one-shot Manus doubled. And obviously, I don't want to be excluded from that count, so it's time to take this seriously. When researching if other people have done this before, I found three videos showcasing a glitchless Manus one-shot, two of them being done by the same person. Two clips showed the player using Chaos Storm, and the other used Fire Tempest. I was going to get into the dumb, boring math, but who cares? The abridged version is that even with the setup for the highest damage output and landing all possible hits, neither spell does enough damage to one-shot Manus. That is, unless he not only gets hit by all the pillars, but decides to jump through at least one of them, since mid-jump he takes bonus counter damage or instability or whatever the hell you want to call it, which boils down, no pun intended, entirely to luck. Ultimately, I chose to use Chaos Storm since it has more theoretical win conditions, but in reality what that means is that by hour 10, the game is still finding new and unique ways to rip my hopes and dreams straight from my still beating heart. <gasps> oh? Oh, please! Please! <gasps> I don't want to play Dark Souls anymore. Times like these call for a change in mindset, so I opted into a bit of roleplay. I wasn't losing a fight over and over due to random factors out of my control, I was soft resetting for a shiny Manus. After that bit of make-believe, and cracking a couple cold ones, it wasn't so bad. Twelve hours of shiny hunting later, the Gestalter fall set in and what used to be Abyss Daddy Manus now looked like the face of God, and I heard him speak to me. He said, stop being a fucking idiot and use the better pyromancy. You see, instead of saying limp dick, nerd shit like, uh, Chaos Storm has more theoretical win conditions, I could have been, you know, winning. So after switching to Fire Tempest, it only took about an hour worth of attempts before finally this happened. <laughs> it wasn't even that hard. Honestly, with the horror stories that other people described, I feel like we got insanely lucky getting it so quickly after switching. I mean, I would hate to have to test that luck again. Thankfully, it's over and done with. Trading with Manus doesn't matter since it still counts as a victory. Now we can waltz back to the arena where the past version of the Dusk of Ulysseal NPC spawns, kill her, and be completely done with this nightmare.
So, I've got some good news and some bad news. Actually, wait, there's no good news. Dusk disappears permanently if the area is reloaded, meaning we're soft-locked out of obtaining a point. This includes quitting out, warping, or dying. I could reload a backup save from before the fight, but... No, you know what? I've been through enough shit already! The last thing I want to do is risk fighting Manus again for another dozen hours. If that makes me a lesser person, then so be it! I shouldn't be expected to put myself through the ringer just for another point in this stupid little contest. Phew. So, I went back. Why the hell did I go back? These attempts were identical to the previous ones, except after every cast we would now desperately flail and panic roll, trying to avoid the follow-up dark bead storm. To my delight, it only took about an hour to land another killing blow. And now I just had to not screw it up somehow. <laughs> Drink, 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 drink! Oh! Oh my god. Oh, holy fuck. And that is all the context needed to justify my childlike elation at the idea of bludgeoning this sleeping woman. Rise and fucking shine. I think it's worth noting that with every other boss, I was able to find videos of people one-shotting them glitchless, but I couldn't find any video evidence anywhere of anyone depleting the whole health bar of the Four Kings in one go in a legitimate way. Because this is actually even worse than Manus. I really couldn't tell if it was even possible, as I couldn't find any footage of a true glitchless one-shot of this boss in this nearly 12-year-old game. In preparation for this, I realized we still have about 80 or so unspent points. Might as well power level vitality and endurance. Honestly, this probably should have been done a long time ago so we could stop getting stunlocked to death by random hollows when walking around, but better late than never. We head to the Painted World to farm souls from this phalanx group. The idea is that we'd be specking our levels so we could equip Havel's set and Great Shield, letting us tank a hit without getting staggered out of an attack animation. I know, someone using Havel's set in a Dark Souls playthrough. Craziest shit you ever saw, right? Outside that, the idea was to just spawn all four kings, fire off a Chaos Storm, and pray. Several hours later, the grind to level 116 is done. We clean up a few more NPCs, then challenge the four kings. So we go in there, wait for the kings to spawn, cast power within, drop our health to red tier stone range, and... Shit. This is never going to work in a million years! Look, as much as I wish I could be the guy, there's a reason that every other one-shot challenge classifies the Four Kings as two bosses. While the Chaos Storm strat is technically, theoretically possible, it is not something that can be done in a human lifespan. Well, that's what I thought at the time, but there is a silver lining to this story. I can't say who, but I have reason to believe that someone in the group pulled it off. So congratulations to them for being the first on record to ever accomplish such a feat. I've been asked not to reveal the identities of anyone participating in this contest, so I'm afraid I'm gonna have to blue ball the shit out of you guys until that person's run is officially revealed. Well, actually, maybe we can make an exception. We're not supposed to, but this time I think the person in question won't mind at all. Because on May 8th, 2023, the first person in the world to successfully one-shot the Four Kings glitchless was a YouTuber by the name of... Me a t j sus. Oh wait, that's me! Sorry guys, I maybe sort of stole your world first and lied about it for months. I've learned my lesson and promise I won't do it again. Since I'm sure most of you are curious, let's get into the detailed breakdown of how this was accomplished, after a quick preface. I just want to say that what I'm about to show is specifically allowed in our rule set and ambiguous in Vegeta 311's rules. It feels more like exploiting a loophole than a proper one-shot, but I guess cry about it? To do it, we'll be utilizing the most underrated pyromancy in the game. Fire Surge. They all scoffed at you, called you worthless, but today they will acknowledge 
your true potential. Since one ring slot is already locked in, the other slot is taken up by the red tier stone ring to maximize our damage potential. If done properly, we shouldn't be taking a hit at all, but I paid for this entire health bar and damn it, I'm gonna use it. Immediately after dropping into the void, start counting the seconds. Cast power within and run to where the second king spawns. There are no visual indicators in the void, so what I did was run about 15 degrees west from where the first king spawns for about 6 seconds, then wait on the spot. Although a more consistent idea is to sacrifice your life on the second king's spawn point and use your bloodstain as a visual cue. Shield or dodge attacks is necessary without deviating from this spot. Approximately 30 seconds from when you landed in the void, take a hit to drop your health into red tear stone range and start spraying. Remember to keep spraying into the first king's body during his death animation as it will still detract from the boss's health pool. If done correctly, you should get something that looks a bit like this. Please, 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 please! Ah! Oh! Ah! 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 <laughs> There's no fucking way. Oh! <laughs> I forgot to heal. I have my hands off my controller. I was popping off way too hard. To be honest, that wasn't hard at all, and I'm baffled that nobody else has done it before. Dr. Titus, Ray Dimitri, step up your game, please. Well, now that I've pissed off a bunch of people, it's time to abruptly shift the tone of this video to something more melancholic. We may have cleared the supposed hardest boss of this run, but one final challenge still awaits. The emotional one. These blacksmiths are the heart and soul of this entire story, and it truly broke my heart to see them go. Especially the giant blacksmith. Don't say that. Don't say that! Don't, don't, don't say that! <laughs> After all the atrocities I've committed, I have only Oswald with whom to reconcile my sins. Unfortunately, I'm going to perpetrate one final crime that he can't absolve. The Kiln of the Flame, our final frontier. The last obstacle we had yet to clear. Gwyn, Lord of Cinder, a decrepit old shell. With one final strike, we're both freed from this hell. As I walk through the shadow of the Valley of Death, I take a look at my life and realize there's nothing left. Cause I've been blasting and laughing so long that even my mama thinks that my mind is gone, but I ain't never crossed a man who didn't deserve- <clears throat> Ladies and gentle gamers, with Gwyn defeated, the final point total is in. Out of a possible 130 points, we've scored a grand total of 120... Oh dude, what did I miss? Well, screw that whole speech then, good thing we're allowed backup saves. So, after reviewing literally all of the footage, I have at last located the missing piece. This Black Knight at the Undead Burg at the start of the game. What a joke. Back at the kiln, we finish a quick rematch with Gwyn, and now, finally, that's a perfect 130 point score. You know, assuming I didn't get disqualified for anything. And if I did, I probably deserved it. As for whether or not this score is enough to win the competition, you'll have to check out the final verdict over on the Backlogs channel. If someone did end up tying with me, he's apparently gonna go full Mario Party and start awarding bonus stars for random, irrelevant shit. I kind of hope it comes down to that, because it would be really funny. I know I talked mad shit earlier, but this entire run was completed on the shoulders of giants, and I had exactly two original ideas throughout, so credit where credit is due, and let's not pretend I'm good at this game. Anyways, I'm gonna go outside and touch breasts now. See ya!